Welcome to First Presbyterian Church Asheville. We are so excited that you are joining us for worship this day. If you are new to joining our virtual online worship experience, I want to offer a special welcome to you. We are a congregation that seeks to experience the love of Jesus Christ by practicing radical hospitality, forming deep relationships, and joining and shared ministry. Since we are worshiping online and are unable to see your faces, please connect with us. Let us know if you have any questions about ways to be involved in the life of our congregation. You can do this by going to our website and on the Connect tab, you can click on Connect with us. We'd love to hear your prayer requests and answer any questions that you might have. A couple of upcoming events I'd like to highlight. This Wednesday, September 16th from 5.30 to 6.45, we will begin an outdoor music makers for families. This is for those that have children between kindergarten and fifth grade. We'll have a picnic style family dinner and we'll worship on the lawn. Watch your email for more information and details. On Saturday, September 19th at 8 o'clock p.m. via Zoom, we'll be hosting a gala for our new Created to Create virtual exhibit. Also, check your email for an invitation to come with more details about this exciting event. Lastly, the church retreat will take place on October 2nd and 3rd. Prior information has been sent out about this. Though the retreat will be virtual, there will be opportunities to participate in real life. Please check out the website and bulletin and past information that has been sent out to register for this free event. Talent show videos are due soon, so please get your talent recorded. We look forward to seeing you soon and, and seeing how we are all pieced together. I'd now like to turn it over to Evan, who's going to share a little bit about the upcoming Crop Walk. Hi, my name is Evan, and I'm a youth here at FIRST. The youth, as well as others, will be walking for Crop Walk this year, and we need sponsors to support our walk. There is a link in the bulletin to find registered walkers. All donations can be given online. If you want to participate, the Crop Walk is virtual this year. All you need to do is register and walk at home. It takes one minute to register online. It's super easy. If you are unsure of what crop walk is, well, it began in the 40s when farmers gave some of their crops to support those that were hungry. Let's work to stop hunger one step at a time. There's more information on our website as well as in the church bulletin for ways to be a part of our community. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Join me Hear the word of the Lord. Sing to the Lord, for God is highly exalted. The Lord is our strength and our salvation. Come, let us worship God. The Lord be with you, and also with you.
we know that nothing is able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Let us in freedom confess our sins against God and neighbor, joining together in one voice. God of love and justice, we long for peace within and peace without. We long for harmony in our families, for serenity in the midst of struggle. We long for the day when our homes will be a dwelling place for your love. Yet we confess that we are often anxious. We do not trust each other, and we harbor violence. We are not willing to take the risks and make the sacrifices that love requires. Look upon us with kindness and grace. Rule in our homes and in all the world. Show us how to walk in your paths through the mercy of our Savior. God's love for us has no bounds. God sets our feet on dry ground. God liberates us, reconciles us, redeems us. Sisters and brothers, declare with me the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. the children to come close because I have a story to share with you. It is more in the story of Moses. There's a lot in the Bible about what happened to Moses and the people of God and we're going to tell lots of it. We started last week and we told the first bit of it and today we're going to add on to our story with a little bit more. Listen to this. Many years ago the people of God were trapped they were slaves in the land of Egypt, and they could not go home. There were so many of them that the Pharaoh was afraid they would take his kingdom away from him, so he made a terrible law that all the Hebrew baby boys should be killed. One of the mothers made a basket, and she hid her baby boy inside, and the baby's sister Miriam followed it as it floated all the way to Pharaoh's palace. The daughter of Pharaoh found the basket. She named the baby Moses. His sister made sure he was safe and Moses grew up. 
One day, Moses, who had become a shepherd, was caring for the sheep and saw a bush that was burning, but did not burn up. And God spoke to Moses from the burning bush and said, Moses, I've heard the cries of my people in Egypt. Go down and tell the Pharaoh, let my people go. So Moses went to Egypt to tell Pharaoh to let the people go. With his shepherd's staff, Moses went many times, and many times Pharaoh said no. Moses did many signs and wonders with his staff, and also terrible things happened in the land of Egypt. But God told the people of God how to be safe, and the darkness passed over them. After the terrible things happened, Pharaoh told Moses that the people of God could leave Egypt, and they hurried to pack all they could carry. They baked bread for the journey so fast that it had no time to rise. It was flat, and then they went into the desert. The desert is a dangerous place. No one goes into the desert unless they have to. The people of God hurried until they came to the sea. The Egyptians followed them in their chariots, and the army of Pharaoh pushed the people against the water, and they didn't know what to do. They were trapped again. God came so close to Moses, and Moses came so close to God, that Moses knew how to lead the people through the water into freedom. This one looks so scared, he can barely move. This one is happy. This one is a little confused. When all the people of God were safe on the other side, the water closed behind them and they were free. Pharaoh's army could not follow. The people were so happy to be free, they just had to give thanks to God. And Miriam, the sister of Moses, led the dancing. I wonder what happens next to Moses and the people of God. I wonder how the people of God felt when they came to the water and were trapped again. I wonder why the people danced on the other side of the water. I wonder if you have ever been happy enough to dance like that. You can tell the story of Moses yourself using materials from your Faith at Home kits. Some of you picked them up last Sunday, others had them delivered or will soon. And you can find instructions about how to make the story of Moses to tell at home on our website. Let's have a prayer. O oh God, you are always with us, just as you were with the people of God as they walked through the water. You are with us too, no matter where we go, no matter if we're frightened or confused or happy. Help us trust that you are always there. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Sisters and brothers, let us live and love through Jesus Christ. Let us share the peace of God through loving one another. Let us share the peace of God this day. If you are worshiping with others or if someone has been placed on your heart, share the peace of Christ with them. The peace of Christ be with you. This morning we're going to sing our prayer for illumination. Your part is just a simple alleluia. I'll introduce it once and then Nick and Kim will repeat it and then they're going to sing it as a round. Feel free to just join in with whichever voice you would like and I'll sing a short verse above the alleluia.
Listen now for the Word of God coming to us from Exodus chapter 14, beginning at verse 10. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to keep still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. But you lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the Israelites may go into the sea on dry ground. Then I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And so I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army, his chariots and his chariot drivers. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gained glory for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his chariot drivers. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. Today we're going to dig into the topic of evil. And that may be not what you're prepared to do sitting at home in, on your couch and in your pajamas and maybe with your cup of coffee to think deeply about the question of evil. Of course, the truth is, evil is always an awkward topic to bring up. When we baptize a person here at this font, or when we confirm a teenager in confirmation, when we welcome a new member into the church, or when we ordain and install new officers, we ask three questions of faith, and the first one talks about evil. It's always jarring. It goes like this, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? Every time I get to that question and to that part of the question about evil, it just feels like it doesn't fit. I mean, imagine it, there's a, there's a family standing here, a mom and a dad, they're well-dressed and smiling, they're holding a baby. The grandparents are in the front row preparing to take a picture. And suddenly the minister asks, do you renounce evil and its power in the world? What's that supposed to mean anyway? What do you do with that? It's gotten even more awkward in Zoom calls. So this past week our session received a new member into the church. It's a wonderful thing, delightful, that a person has, has decided through virtual worship and virtual community that God is leading them to be a part of this congregation. So there we are in a virtual Zoom session meeting, and, and some people are on their porch, and some people are on their couch, and some people have a TV going in the background, and someone else has dinner on the stove, and we're having an informal conversation. And then I ask, do you renounce evil and its power in the world? What do you mean by that? What do we mean by that? And how, how do we even answer that? What does it mean when we answer yes to that question? Usually when we think of evil, we think of evil spirits. We think of a force outside of ourselves, somewhere out there in the world that works on us, that maybe takes control of a person or a situation and, and creates evil. Or if you think of evil, you might think of being concentrated in a human being. One person who is so uh, cruel, who who, in whom it concentrates so much wickedness that that person is evil. Uh, maybe Hitler is evil, or Bin Laden is evil, or a mass murderer is evil. In our Reformed tradition, and Presbyterians are part of the Reformed tradition, in our Reformed theological tradition, though, we've always understood that evil has a broader human dimension than that. We believe that evil shows up not just as a spirit out there that works on us from the outside, but that we can find evil 
inside, anywhere there is power in the world, institutions, cultures, traditions, norms, behaviors, there's evil at work. And evil does not just show up in isolated individuals that we can pick out of history, but evil can be found in all of us. It touches all of us. In Hebrew Scripture, Egypt and Pharaoh are are metaphors for evil. They become, in Scripture, the personification of evil. We've been following the people of Israel on their journey out of slavery, and then we're about to follow them on their journey through the wilderness right up to the Promised Land. In the beginning of this story, we heard how Pharaoh wanted to, to bring these people to their knees. They had been enslaved in Egypt for 400 years, but Pharaoh was afraid of their power and what they might do. And so he called Shifra and Pua and said, Come, when a Hebrew woman gives birth, if it's a boy, I want you to kill the boy. And thankfully, Shifra and Pua had enough moral conscience and good sense to not follow that order. And then later, Pharaoh said, if, if a boy is born he, born, he must be thrown into the river. It's the personification of of evil. And we read that the Egyptians begin to treat the Hebrew slaves ruthlessly with even more cruelty. It says their lives were were made bitter. Egypt and Pharaoh becomes for us and for the Hebrew Scriptures the personification of evil and all the forces that are arrayed against God. So God tells Moses that he has heard the cries of the people and wants to set the people free. God sends Moses to Pharaoh and says to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses, the shepherd who stammers and is of unsure speech, he goes into the presence of Pharaoh with his his shepherd's staff. He says what he was told to say. God says, let my people go. What did Pharaoh say? Who's going to make me? And at that point in this story, it becomes not just about the freedom of the people of Israel from slavery. It becomes about God's victory over evil. You see, from that point in the story, we begin to see how God is determined to claim a victory over the evil that is personified by Pharaoh and Egypt. And that story comes to a climax. Chapters 13 and 14 come to a climax here at the banks of the Red Sea where Israel has encamped. They see the Egyptians coming fast on their heels and they cry out to God for help. God says, get moving. God will deal with the Egyptians. So the Israelites take one tentative step into the river on dry ground. And the waters, it says, begin to pile up as as tall as the waters of a fortress, as the walls of a fortress. And they walk through on dry ground. But then, the Egyptians plunged in after them. The mud of that river came back and it it grabbed the wheels of the chariots and they couldn't move. They were knee deep in the mud of that sea. Before long, those walls of water came crashing down and drowned the Egyptians. The story ends that the Israelites looked back and saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. And they feared the Lord. Now that makes us uncomfortable. It raises some tough questions for us. I mean, God set the people of Israel free with ten plagues and then drowned the Egyptians in the Red Sea. So the story goes. Do we really believe that God killed all the firstborn children of Egypt? Are we really supposed to believe that God drowned all of those soldiers who went into the sea following orders? 
I don't believe that we are meant to take this story as a historical fact. Because I don't believe that the God who is revealed as incarnate love would wade knee deep in the blood of enemies like that. But I do believe, I do believe that this story is told and this story has been kept for 2,000 years to help us understand how seriously God takes evil and how determined God is to win a victory over evil. I'm glad that Jeremy led us in that song, goodness is stronger than evil, love is stronger than hate, light is stronger than darkness, life is stronger than death, victory is ours, victory is ours through God who loves us. That's the purpose of this story. See, Pharaoh and the Egyptians personify evil as it shows up in the broad human dimensions of our lives. We see this kind of evil expressed as white supremacy. When we talk about a, a long history and culture of placing one race at an advantage and another race at a disadvantage, of privileging one over the other and the multi-generational advantages and poverties that stack up in that kind of culture. That's the power of evil at work in the world. We see this kind of evil at work in the world when we look at a culture of violence. Whether it's a show or a movie or a video game or gun laws. When we look at the ways, the many ways that our culture celebrates violence, celebrates the way that one person is violent against another. It's the power of evil at work in the world, in culture. We see this kind of power at work in the world in an economic system that means that even those who are on the very bottom cannot make enough to have the basic goods of life. When a society has enough to eat, but hungry people are still hungry, that at its most basic level is a manifestation of evil. When a society has enough health care, but sick people still go sick, that at its most basic level is a manifestation of evil. When we renounce evil and its power in the world, it means that we reject all of those ways that evil shows up in our institutions, in our governments, in our cultures, in our norms, in our ways of life, and our ways of thinking. Of course, evil is not just out there in all those things. Evil is also in here, in each of us. It was Alexander Solzhenitsyn who wrote in the book Gulag, the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. You see, we're all children of Egypt. And all of us have something inside that wants to be Pharaoh. When we're feeling insecure about ourselves, we're feeling that we're not quite good enough, there's this little voice that says, you know, if you make someone else feel insecure, if you show a little domination, you'll feel better about yourself. When we're feeling weak or vulnerable, there's this little voice that says, if you exert some power over someone else, you'll, you'll feel stronger. When we're feeling like we want to give up, when we're feeling like life has no meaning, when we're sensing the despair that lurks, there's this little voice that says, you know, the only way to fix this is to give up, just die. Those nudges, those whispers are the manifestations of evil in our own lives. When we renounce evil and its power in the world, we not only renounce evil in the voice of the public square, but we also renounce evil in the whispers on our own shoulders. Those whispers that tempt and nudge and prompt us towards violence and domination, self-loathing and despair. 
course, renouncing evil is easier said than done. The only way we can hope to do it is with God's help. Earlier, when we said our confession, we received an assurance of God's grace from the font. That font reminds us of the Christian story that in Jesus Christ, God has fully and finally defeated evil. In Jesus Christ, in the death and resurrection of Christ, God finished what God began in the Red Sea. God has defeated, God has drowned evil. For us who are baptized in Christ, we are given the grace, the help, to truly renounce evil and to live into a new way of life. We're given the grace and the help to walk into a new promised land, the kingdom of God. How do we do that? How do we walk into this new way of life? I think the first way that we do that is to pray. N.T. Wright said that the mystery of prayer, that we are caught up in the struggle to bring God's wise and healing order into the world. It's in the mystery of prayer that we're caught up in the struggle to bring God's wise and healing order into the world. We can pray that the blinders from our own eyes will be taken off. We'll be able to see the ways that we've been complicit in evil and done harm to others. We can pray for those who have been harmed and are being harmed by the evil that shows up in the broad systems and structures of our world. We can pray for their well-being. We can pray that they would be delivered. We can pray that God's reign of justice and peace will come on earth and that we'll see it with our own eyes. We can pray. And we can act. We can act by forgiving those who have done us harm when we've been on the receiving end of, of the manifestation of evil. We can forgive. We can seek forgiveness from those whom we have harmed when, when the forces and powers of evil have worked through our lives such that other people have been harmed even if we didn't realize it. Even if we didn't know it. When we see it, we can seek forgiveness. We can serve and love those who have been harmed by the powers and forces of evil at work in the world in practical, tangible ways. And we can advocate for the systems and structures and traditions and even our cultures and histories to be changed so that that evil is not carried forward to future generations. When the Hebrews got to the other side of the Red Sea, Moses and Miriam broke out in song. Their song started, I will sing to the Lord, for the Lord has triumphed. They finished, the Lord will reign forever. That's our hope. Our hope is in God's victory. And with our hope firmly fixed there, in God's victory, we answer the question, do you renounce evil and its power in the world?
invite you to join me, join me responsively as we recite from the 15th chapter of Exodus, an affirmation of faith based on Miriam's song. We will sing it to the Lord who has triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The, the Lord, Lord is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. This is our God whom we will praise, the God of our forebears whom we will exalt. The Lord is a warrior, the Lord is his name. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. At the blast of your breath, the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. In your unfailing love, O Lord, you lead the people whom you have redeemed. By your invincible strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. You will bring them in and plant them, O Lord, in the sanctuary which your hands have established. Glory, Glory be to, to God, the God, Father, Father Son, and Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Today we take a moment to recognize and lift up Olivia Bell, Margaret, and Meredith as they begin a year in special ministry. Olivia Bell, Margaret, and Meredith have been invited to be mission scholars which is a one-year program through Youth Mission Co., which is a nonprofit ministry organization, also Asheville Youth Mission. Olivia Bell, Margaret, and Meredith will be spending the year engaging in local community by volunteering at several agencies and ministries, reflecting on the Bible's teachings about Christian mission, exploring the reasons why members of our community are struggling in poverty and marginalization, and discerning what God is calling them to do to make a lasting impact. Olivia Bell, Margaret, and Meredith will not be doing this work alone. Each participant in the program is placed in a cohort with other mission scholars. And over the course of the year, they will get to know youth from close by and around the country who also care about serving others and creating a more just world. We celebrate their desire to engage in this holy work and we want to support them on this journey. So we make the following promises to one another. So to Olivia Bell, Margaret and Meredith, do you promise to give your all this year as you participate in Mission Scholar Program, serving our local neighbors, studying scripture, learning about the root causes of injustice, and discerning God's will for your life? If so, say, I do. I do. I do. Do you promise to keep our congregation in your mind and heart as you engage in this process? reflecting on what we have taught you about the way of Christ as you take this journey this year. If so, say, I do. I do. I do. I do. When you have completed this program, do you promise to share what you have learned, the ways that you have grown, and to help lead us as a congregation in our community outreach so that we may continue to be the faithful servants of Christ? If so, say, I do. I do. I do. Let us pray. God of all times and places, we give you thanks for the ways you call us to learn, grow, and serve. We ask for your hand to remain upon Olivia, Bell, Margaret, and Meredith as they begin this journey with you and the other mission scholars. Guide them in serving our local neighbors, in reading your word, and discerning your call in their life. We pray these things in the name of Jesus the Christ the greatest example of your love. Amen. 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 Will you join me in prayer? Sovereign God, ruler of creation, you spread out the expanse of the heavens and dug the depths of the lakes and seas. You forested the earth and stocked land and sea with swarms of your creatures. You called human beings forward to bear your image, caring for creation, caring for each other, 
thriving in the light of your love. We confess to you, holy God, that we have often spoiled your gifts, abusing creation, ignoring each other, turning our backs on your love. Because we did not make ourselves, cannot keep ourselves, and could never forgive ourselves, we turn to you, our Creator, Savior, and Keeper. We bring you thanks for Sabbath rest, for a break from work, for this time of worship and friends who gather in spirit, for your word that may be opened and preached in our lives, for your name on the lips of people we respect. We thank you, O God, that we may wake refreshed from a night's sleep, alert to the possibilities of a new day, ready for your gifts to find and bless us. We bring you thanks, O God, for nourishing food and nourishing friends, for sunny, unspoiled toddlers, and for elderly veterans rich with wisdom. We give you thanks for work to do and energy to do it, for fine arts and fine artists in all their beauty and skill. We give you thanks, O God, for sports and games, for patriots and heroes, for wonderful things to read. Even on the rainiest Monday morning of our lives, we have reason to thank you, to bless you, and to turn our faces towards the radiance of your love. O God, especially for your grace, your amazing grace, so old, so new, always reminding us of our dependence on you, always healing with your mercy. For your grace, we give you thanks, O God. Care for our restless world, we pray. In your mercy, calm the places of tension. Stimulate the imaginations of peacemakers. Strengthen the hands of those who work to heal and protect. Defend the weak, cure the sick, and send forth prophets who preach good news to the poor. We pray, O God, for the church across the world. Revive the church and make us strong so that we may serve your purposes, increase your glory, and bring joy into all the corners of heaven. Take into your care, Lord God, those of us who have been betrayed. Blend in us justice and love so that we are able to renounce evil with courage, but also reach and yearn for unholy persons to become holy. When we stiffen against your grace, soften us. When we sag under the weight of our duty, stiffen us. O oh God, we did not make ourselves, cannot keep ourselves, and could never forgive ourselves. And so we turn to you, our Maker, Provider, and Savior, through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 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 God is unfailing in blessing and love. Let us live our lives generously. Today we are collecting the five cents a meal offering. This offering goes through our presbytery effort and goes towards hunger relief regionally and nationally. You can give to five cents a meal as well as to First Presbyterian Church online under the Give tab on our website, or you can mail a check into the church office. Please join me responsibly in our call to the offering. As we come before God with our tithes and offerings, let us remember the words of Micah 6. What does the Lord require of us? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Thus we bring our money, gifts, and whole lives as an offering to God. One, two, three. <laughs> Yeah. 
when white turn tide You mounts and hills like rams and lambs Why leap on every side Oh, tremble Thank you for holding us in the safety of your arms, for the new mercies you show us each day, for these gifts which we bring before you. Enable the work of love and the righteousness of your kingdom to be multiplied in this world. Strengthen our resolve to love and show mercy. Lead our feet to your holy dwelling place. Guide the work you have for us this day. In Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. Friends, do not be afraid, take heart, be of good courage, for goodness is stronger than evil, love is stronger than hate, light is stronger than darkness, and life is stronger than death. 
To the glory of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may the love and peace of God be yours. Amen. Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. The peace of Christ be with you.